I'd like to welcome everyone who's joining us tonight to the November webinar for the Academy of Craniofacial Pain. The topic is laser assisted non surgical therapies for addressing craniofacial pain and sleep disordered breathing. Tonight, we're going to discuss the science and technology that are evolving to improve access to innovative approaches to patient care. The Academy of Craniofacial Pain community strives to encourage our members to explore treatment options for their patients. This is one of the ways that we like to do that. This presentation will allow the viewer to become familiar with several non-surgical laser-assisted techniques carefully are currently available to address supporting patients suffering from craniofacial pain, as well as sleep disordered breathing. We're going to be talking about the mechanism of action of light-based energy to create changes in both functional and structural aspects of the craniofacial region. We're gonna create an awareness for the multiple clinical applications of these technologies and techniques. We're gonna learn about the different wavelengths of non-ionizing energy delivered by several of the laser delivery systems that are being utilized by providers from all over the world to create therapeutic tissue and cellular level changes to improve sleep quality and reduce the severity of craniofacial pain. And our other goal is to hope that you guys become a little bit more familiar with some of the specific techniques being utilized by our community of providers to include, improve the quality of life for their patients. I want to introduce myself first. My name is Dr. Angie Tenholder. I'm a proud member of the Academy of Craniofacial Pain. I have fellowship status, currently serving as a director on the board of directors and as the educational committee chairperson. I am also board certified a diplomate in the American Board of Craniofacial Dental Sleep Medicine, where I'm currently serving as the president. I have a fellowship in the Academy of General Dentistry, but my biggest and most important initials are that I'm a mom and a wife of people who have craniofacial pain and sleep disordered breathing, and I've had to use all of those letters to help them. I love the fact that I do a bunch of different things, but one of the things that I am always going to be is a perpetual student because I am a former chronic pain patient, and this is one of the tools that I now use to help myself and others. Disclosures is that I'm a president of the Alpha Interface Academy, the Synergy Dental Solutions Corporation, which is my private practice, and the Synergy Academy, which is my teaching organization. I also want to introduce you to Dr. Kim Letterman, and I'm going to have her introduce herself. She is my partner with the, not only Academy of Craniofacial Pain as my education co-chairperson, but she is the immediate pre past president of the American Board of Cranium Facial Dental Sleep Medicine, and we both share a passion for this. So Dr. Letterman would like to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Kim Letterman. Um, my portion of the presentation that you're gonna hear later on is gonna provide a review of some of the ways we're using laser in our office. So I have a TMD in sleep practice. We currently have four providers, three dentists and one nurse practitioner, and an amazing administrative and clinical team. I love to learn and I love to be involved in organizations that have missions of helping healthcare professionals gain knowledge so that we can continually improve the care and education that we're providing to our patients and to the public. I am on, as um, Dr. Tenholder mentioned, on the AACP Education Committee, and we're very fortunate to have Dr. Tenholder as our chair. Well, thank you very much. And as you can see by all of her awards and accomplishments, she has a lot to offer, and I'm glad that she was able to join me in presenting this evening. Disclosure, so this is gonna have one CE credit through ADA SERP and AGD PACE. The subject code is 135. We have the conflicts of interest that we've already disclosed as presenters, and there's no conflict of interest for the Academy of Craniofacial Pain. We'd like everyone to submit questions in the chat box this evening, and we're gonna have a discussion session following our presentations. So we all know that there could be multiple versions of the truth at the same time. For example, we're both in the Midwest, we're both in the USA, and we're both in North America. So there's all different levels of things that can still be correct, even with broader scopes of what we're talking about. We're going to use that same analogy as we talk about the different types of physiological changes that can be supported through laser assisted therapies. We not only can make system level changes, which a lot of us are used to doing through appliances and different therapeutic modalities, but we can also make tissue level changes and cellular changes down to the mitochondrial level. And what we're gonna be discussing today is a lot of the tissue level changes involving hyaluronic acid and fascia and photobiomodulation. 
But the bigger issues, what we all can measure and see easily are the, the oral neuromyofunctional influences and in how we help patients with myofascial pain, temporomandibular joint disorder and sleep disordered breathing. And I thought we should just go ahead and go over what is pain. You know, we, we gloss over some of the things that are the most important, but when I started doing my research on how to describe it, it says pain is difficult to quantify, measure, and document. And so psychosocial factors are important to consider because that experience of pain is unique to each patient. What we are finding out is through these laser assisted therapies that we can actually also address those psychosocial factor, factors, which makes therapy that much more impactful. And what is sleep disordered breathing? A lot of different definitions. A lot of people will honestly admit, including some of the leaders in our field, that they don't even really know what it is because it is changing all the time. So it's not just snoring. It's not just obstructive sleep apnea. There's a lot of other types of sleep disordered breathing and sleep related breathing disorders that arise during sleep and many different origins of that, including trigeminal cardiac reflux, restless leg syndrome, vitamin D deficiencies, which is actually a hormone, glucose and gly glycogen metabolism, cortisol level, and pain itself can induce sleep disordered breathing. PTSD is another major source of sleep fragmentation that is affecting many people in our societies. And what do all these conditions have in common? Sometimes it's hard to see where we're going because there's so many things to consider. I would like to challenge everyone to think about what went wrong along the way when this person was growing and living, because we're not designed as humans to need forced air or plastic appliances to support our airway. We all know that sleep is mysterious and multifactorial, and we're growing and learning in those changes. And a lot of those changes are being understood because of our understanding of laser physiology. So let's think about what can be done to get the system back online for a patient that has all of the things wrong with them. First, we understand what, when did it start? We're really grasping the concept of the importance of pediatric airway in our communities and helping our patients at the earliest stages the breakdown happens. But I'm gonna challenge everyone to also understand that if we're changing the structure, we should also understand how to encourage the functional improvements to support the structural changes. And if those changes are not congruent with something that the body recognizes as normal and natural, sometimes those conditions won't improve, especially if there's trauma involved and the tissue becomes rigid and damaged and that can negatively impact overall function. So I chose these three images because I like to catch people in the rumble strips before they actually get very, very, very symptomatic. And we can talk about structure and function is interrelated and we can't say one problem is bigger than the others. But anyone who has a patient who has had a lot of um, scarring of their lips with the goal of inducing collagen, you know that they can become less than flexible. We need to think about both things. And what is the mechanism of action of cellular communication? Recent developments show that the neural stimulation with light is possible and shaped the field of neural stimulation and neuromodulation. We're figuring out this is how cells communicate. And the wavelength, radiation, radiant energy, all of these things will change the tissue at the level of the chromophore, endogenous and exogenous, which absorb the radiation and convert it to chemical energy. And heating that target tissue is part of the way that that works, but the other part is photoacoustic effects. I'm gonna be speaking directly to the wavelength that I use in my practice. And then Dr. Letterman's also gonna be talking about other wavelengths that are available for use. So we're gonna be mentioning today about the 1064 nanometer wavelength, because it is very unique in its ability to pass through the superficial layers of the skin and gets deep into the belly of the muscle or the layer of the fascia that contains oxyhemoglobin. And when that selectively warms that tissue, it can reduce the friction or the glue of the hyaluronic acid layer in between the deep fascia and the muscle bundle. And what's so nice about this is that we can create instant range of motion or reduction in pain without having to worry about creating damage through an ablative procedure, which a lot of people think that that's all that lasers are is they can just cut something. And that's not true. 
we can do non-ablative procedures that are extremely therapeutic. This is just a graphic of the unique nature of that 1064 wavelength. And that's available for anyone if you look it up. But I just wanted to show what this little bitty dip that we take and how we get oxyhemoglobin targeted for our therapeutic modalities. So when we are using photobiomodulation, which just you know, 10, 20 years ago, a lot of people thought was snake oil. And now we're really grasping the benefit of it because from a neurological perspective, perspective it does a control alt delete like a reset, but it also gives a power boost. From a vascular perspective, we're getting vasodilation, increased oxygenation and decreased inflammation. And at cellular level, we're getting ATP production, nitric oxide in reactive oxygen species. And neurons are cells that contain mitochondria. So we're activating the neurologic system that drives our body. And that cannot be emphasized enough. And that wavelength is important. What they found out, and this was in the context of laser lipolysis, that compared to the 980, which is a more common wavelength for a lot of the therapeutic lasers, 1064 penetrated, penetrated deeper and allowed a um, more profound temperature increase within allowable ranges. And our goal when we're using the 1064 wavelength is to get that temperature to be perfect so we can get the hyaluronic acid to loosen up, to create glide in that tissue and also get functional improvements immediately. Because hyaluronic acid is increased in, con in concentration during inflammation, but it can be modified. So when our patients are coming into our office and they have inflammation, we're able to modify it. And the Stecos have done some amazing work with understanding how that hyaluronic acid restriction impacts fascia, especially in their research with chronic neck pain syndrome, which those of us who do what we do are very familiar with patients who have chronic neck pain. So what they found out is if the hyaluronic acid content of the fascia is increased due to immobility or injury, the viscosity would also be increased and the film lubricating properties are reduced. So think about that. And the longer the hyaluronic acid is dense and not moving, the harder it is for the muscles to work against it. And so the muscles get stiffer. And deep friction manipulation, which is everyone who's had a deep tissue massage knows that it might feel okay afterwards, but it certainly doesn't feel good doing. That's how we traditionally through manual therapies aided the outflow of the hyaluronic acid, but it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good at all. And the longer the patient has been in the situation, the harder it is to get them out of it. So what they've been doing for years is fascial manipulation to interrupt the memory of the superficial and deep fascia with regard to trauma and internal dysfunction. But they've also found out that when they do this, it had an effect on the autonomic nervous system and all the organs that are affected by the autonomic afferents. So think about if we're able to do fascia blasting with the 1064 wavelength, then we can get down to that layer without causing any trauma. It feels really good and allow repair and regeneration. And that picture on the right is what fascia looks like under a microscope. If you pair physical stretching, which is what the manual therapists, including the stecos, have been doing for years, plus the pulse indie YAG laser, which is what the 1064 that I use does, we get even better results because we're loosening up those layers of tissue and we're mobilizing them at the same time. That's pretty magical. So the traditional methods do not feel good. And here we're supposed to be trying to help with pain, not cause it. But that Optimal thermal stimulus to the side of the restriction allows us to work smarter and not harder. They also found out the hyaluronic acid is actually the signal passed between cells. So as we're mobilizing hyaluronic acid, the brain's like, oh good, it's finally moving, this feels great. So it just aids the whole process of healing and recovering from injury. And this cross-sectional diagram is taken at the level of the thyroid. And we're talking about how much fascial layers that we're dealing with in the head and neck and all the cranial nerves that are innervated by that. But take a look just a little bit higher and what you're going to find 
that is also fascially innervated and incredibly influenced, which is the tongue. And there's so many people who are, you know, very aware of the benefits of a tongue that works well, but a lot of them aren't very aware of what the fascia neurology have to do with that tongue and how the neurologic connection from the tongue to the brain might be just as important as the structure that's visible. So what is a restriction and what is a complete release of the tongue? The research that's being done by Dr. Dinky Mills out of New Zealand has found out from postmortem dissection that the lingual frenulum is not composed of connected tissue fibers that have an AP orientation, nor is it a discrete quarter band. What she found during dissection is the fascial fibers that form the frenulum have a basket weave orientation as across the midline. And her statement is the posterior tongue tie classification is based on a construct of a midline submucosal band was not supported by any of her dissections. This was the drawing that she released as a result of her research that the red line is the mucosa, the green line is the fascia, and obviously the muscle underneath it is being depicted by the hash mark. She said, you cannot look at a tongue tie and tell if the muscle is going up into that mucosal fold or not. Not very clearly, at least. The link at the bottom is a really, really good podcast that she recorded about her concerns about the tongue tie world and the terrain that we're dealing with right now. And that's also her research that she has published. So what part of the iceberg sunk the Titanic? Was it the part that could be seen or the part that couldn't be seen? So what if fascial function is actually a really important thing to consider and there's not many people looking at it and we're like the scientists all feeling an elephant with blindfolds on? Is it a trunk or is it a spear? Is it a rope or is it a tail? Is it a wall or is it the side of the elephant? What are we actually looking at? Because there's a lot of babies getting hurt. There's a lot of people getting hurt from misdiagnosis and complications during infant phrenotomy. And maybe it's because we need to know a little bit more about the sublingual anatomy. And that's what Dr. Mills has been working with. Additionally, during the surgical procedure, the research shows if the epimesium of the genioglossus or any muscle is disrupted, the structure of that hyaluronic acid interface, which is a sliding lubricating layer, if that is disrupted, so is the movement of the tissue. So basically we might be removing one restriction and creating another if that epimesium is not intact after the procedure is performed. Think about throughout history, how we have known that we can control people. We can get compliance by beating into the fascia because trauma is stored in fascia and the body remembers and then also in trigeminal nociception. So think about if we're doing something to interrupt that fascia, are we really getting conversion to a good swallow, which is what is supporting the airway and the neurology and the fascial, the whole mechanism of the body, or are we just getting compliance and weakening it until we can get it to be a little bit more, um, less forceful. And so we can get away with it. Think about that. Oral is the procedure that has changed my life as a provider for craniofacial pain and sleep disorder breathing. It is a procedure that is very specific in its design and how it is applied. And it uses the 1064 nanometer wavelength in a very carefully designed delivery system. And what it does is provides a neurologic reset and integration of the system. And it provides a window of opportunity for healing. And it's very simple but it's also very comprehensive. We turn on the lights so the brain and body can see each other under better circumstances. It's kind of like the makeup after the breakup. I'll have a patient in my chair who I'll be touching the lateral pterygoid region, the sublingual fascia and the buccopharyngeal fascia, and they will be at the top of the pain scale before treatment and they will have zero pain when they leave. And they're amazed. And that's the power of this particular procedure because we can improve neural tone while decreasing fascial tone. We can integrate the cranial nerves, and we increase blood flow and we just allow all of these things to start moving and patients feel really, really good. In addition, we're actually accessing the limbic system. So as in the beginning of the presentation, we talked about how the psychosocial factors are important and the amygdala is how we process pain. 
So we're actually getting in there and changing how we basically perceive the pain through this procedure. Imagine oral A's is like a reset, like an AED. There's a bad rhythm. We send energy in. We help to reset it. CPR is going to be like the manual therapies, massage, chiropractic, physical therapy, personal releases that patients can do on themselves. And then if they do need a pacemaker, we do have dental appliances that can help them with that. And baby lays is a procedure that was developed to help the little ones using the concepts of oral A's. Hensler, which Dr. Letterman will be talking about, is actually what I use for trigger points. I don't need to use injections anymore. I use no needles. I actually use my laser to do trigger point therapy, and it's fantastic. Baby lays is what I developed after working with oral lays for years and realizing that babies could benefit from the same technology and technique modified for their specific needs. What we were finding out with baby lays is that we can integrate some optimal primitive reflexes. We can get that floor of the mouth tissue that is soft and supple after treatment when it was hard and restricted before treatment, get babies nursing immediately without having to do a surgical procedure. We get cranial nerve and C fiber stimulation. There's a lot of oxytocin and endorphin released, and it can help that swallow pattern develop very, very gracefully. And what the research also shows is that we're really getting a lot of great vagal tone stimulation. And think about the respiratory vagal, vagal gate that we deal with, because when we are changing the way we process pain through breathing and vagal nerve, we are able to really help patients breathe better. And this is what the research shows that we're, if we're leveraging the cranial nerve system through stimulation, we can target a constellation of brain regions, which is in line with modern neuroscience. It's pretty cool. In addition, the other procedure that is being developed over the last decade or more is laser assisted uvulopalatoplasty. So the tightening of the collagen fibers of the soft palate through the creation of heat is a strictly mechanical approach. However, with Oralase, what we're doing is a neuromus neuromuscular activation. And the Photona product, which is the Lightwalker laser, it basically has been in development for over 12 years and that uses the Erbium YAG wavelength and frequency to be able to modulate tissue through heat. And when they started understanding Oralase and how they were seeing immediate results from using the Indi YAG, which was preheating, but then they also said, well, okay, collagen can't cook that fast to be able to immediately have a palate respond to the stimulus. Couldn't lift the palate before, all of a sudden the palate is lifting, patients are breathing better, sleeping the first night. Collagen doesn't remodel that quickly. They realized that it was the oral neuromyofunctional system that had been accessed and restored because of the ND YAG that was always a part of Oralase. The other companies that are now getting on the bandwagon realizing that there's some clinical benefit to that includes Solea Sleep, which is the CO2 laser. It's been about two years in development. And Light Scalpel is also currently in development of a product to do a similar procedure. And this is through heat in creating less flexibility and redundancy in that palatal tissue. So, but when you think about form and function and how they're reciprocally interconnected and we all have blind spots regarding both aspects of wellness, I want you guys to start thinking about that as you evaluate your patients. And we're all still learning. The Dunning-Kruger effect is one of my favorite things to discuss because as much as I think I know, there's gonna be a patient tomorrow that's gonna walk in my office that's gonna make me question what I think I know. And I want you guys to always challenge what you have been heard or what you've heard and what you've been told a million times, because just because they've been said many, many times doesn't mean that they're absolutely true. As we learn more and when we know better, we do better. And now I'm going to stop my screen share. I'm going to turn the next part of the presentation over to Dr. Letterman. Okay. Hello, everyone, and thanks so much for attending. So Dr. Tenholer did a great job reviewing the science theory and a little about some specialty treatments. And I'm gonna review some other practical applications, many of which we use in our practice. I do wanna mention that of course, proper diagnosis, identifying root causes and perpetuating factors from a physical and a neurological standpoint is important in order to maximize benefits of laser therapy. 
Some of the treatments may help to reset the system. Some may help get them over the hump while your other therapies kick in for long-term relief. And some can help with acute conditions such as a fracture or a lesion. As Dr. Tenholder explained, one of the many benefits of incorporating laser into your practice is that it can help to regulate proper neurological function. It can also have vascular and cellular effects versus just localized pain relief. So it can affect uh, things other than just the part you're shining the laser on. As she had explained earlier, I'm going to do just a brief overview of um, some lasers in dentistry and medicine and some safety precautions. Um, lasers can be classified by the medium used to produce the laser energy, the function, the type of tissue they interact with, and they can be used for diagnostic purposes or hard or soft tissue interaction. Types of lasers that are frequently used in dentistry and medicine include CO2 lasers, um, diodes, superluminous diodes, light emitting diodes, erbium YAG, and neodymium YAG. Lasers are generally classified into four groups. Typically, therapeutic laser that we use in our practice is class three or four. Um, so these do come with some safety precautions because they can cause eye damage, they can cause burns, they can cause fires. So getting the training, appointing a laser safety officer, making sure you're using eye protection, um, keeping in a safe environment, warning signs, etc., is important. There are some contraindications to using lasers, and some of these include using over malignancies, the thyroid gland, a fetus, and bone growth plates in children. So laser is amazing. It can have many wonderful uses, but there are some complications that can occur. As I mentioned earlier, there can be some potential for eye damage, so it's important to use eye protection for you, both yourself and the patient and anyone else that may be in the room. And these, um, the eye protection needs to be specific to the wavelength that you're using. Um, in some cases, if somebody has chronic pain that they've been dealing with for a long time, and you use laser therapy, photobiomodulation, um, it can cause an acute um, flare-up. So some, almost essentially bringing the chronic pain into acute state and then helping to heal from there. So usually this is very temporary. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't use it, but it's good to warn the patient that, uh, who have chronic, the patients who have chronic pain that they might have a, a temporary increase in symptoms before they get better. We have noticed, um, maybe anecdotally, that um, during some of our therapies, um, they, this can, the laser can cause agitation or nausea, and it's seeming to me that we see this more often in patients with chronic pain conditions, um, systemic issues such as Lyme disease, mold toxicity, um, might bring up some trauma from past surgeries, like if they've had um, you know, tongue tie releases or things like that. So just, again, um, this doesn't happen very often, but it's something that you might want to warn your patient, um, things such as this could occur. And these are temporary, so it doesn't mean we can't use the laser in these conditions, but just good for them to be aware that this may happen. This is an incomplete list of some laser brands and types that are used in pain and sleep medicine. So Leia is a CO2 laser, um, uses 9.3 microns. Often used for airway, it has other uses too, but in pain and sleep, this is where it's most often used. The Tona laser has NDA at, at a 1064 nanometer wavelength, as Dr. Tenholder mentioned, and it also has an erbium YAG um, at 2,940 nanometers. Thor is another common laser. That's a light emitting diode cluster. Uh, I think it has some other capabilities too. I don't know much about that one. Um, and then multi-wave lock system has dual wavelengths, usually 808 and 905 nanometers. So all of these are, are um, well-respected, commonly used um, lasers used in pain and sleep. In our office, we currently use these types of lasers more, most often. So we have a Photona, which has, as, as I talked about a minute ago, the neodymium YAG and the erbium YAG at, those, at the 1064 and 2940 wavelengths. And we have Medex, which are very portable. There's, these are super luminous diode or light emitting diode. Um, handheld lasers. Um, we use a light scalpel on occasion, not as much anymore. That's a CO2 surgical laser. So doing lesion removal or uh, which we don't do very often. And um, we used to use it more often for phrenectomies. 
Um, we have HUGA units that we recommend for home use for patients. These are several different wavelengths, one that, the unit that we use. So if, if a um, patient is not able to get into the office very often, they can, they can get some benefit from using these at home. So in our TMD pain and sleep practice, we are using photobiomodulation and laser therapy um, to release myofascial trigger points. And this can include um, a protocol that I'm going to discuss in a minute where we, we use, use the laser hand pieces over these trigger points. We can also incorporate techniques as Dr. Tenhelder mentioned, such as PPRT, which is progressive pressure release technique, Hinsler, which is high intensity non-surgical laser release, um, incorporating acupressure points, which I would like to learn more about, but um, anywhere you can um, use an acupuncture needle, you can shine laser to have some positive effects. Um, releasing and softening fascial restrictions, helping healing. Um, this could be healing from muscle pain, joint pain. This can be healing from fractures or lesions. Um, often, if a patient has a locked jaw, we do some laser release to get things moving better. And we do some other applications specific to oral laser, which I will talk about in a moment. Lasers can also be used for snoring and sleep apnea treatment, um, surgery, as in phrenectomies or lesion removal, restorative dentistry, which we don't do in our office, orthos orthodontics to help with tolerating pain and enhancing what you're doing in an airway and focus TMD um, setting. Um, we do some aesthetics on the side for fun. Um, can be helpful for joint conditions, acupuncture, as I mentioned, healing of fractures, soft tissue management, and healing of lesions or removal of lesions. And of course, in, in those cases, biopsy would be a very good idea and suspicious lesions. Typical protocols, if we're using photobiomodulation for pain, we most often, we do use the Medex laser, which I had mentioned earlier, but most often we're using the 1064 wavelength. Um, depending on the area of head and neck pain that you're treating, um, we will choose um, which handpiece based on the size of the area mostly, and um, whether we're going to do intraoral or extraoral treatment. Um, so, and then choose the appropriate settings. There's usually at least a couple of different commonly used settings for, for each handpiece for photobiomodulation that we use. This is new. You know, there's not no universally accepted standard dosage for photobiomodulation, but there is a dose response curve for specific applications, meaning that it's possible to do it too often or too much, and that can actually have an inhibitory effect in healing. So you don't want to do it too often, and you don't want to do it too, with too much intensity. It can also cause some damage if you're if you're too intense. Generally, the treatment, like if we're using the 1064, um, we don't want it to be to be hot, especially for photobiomodulation. Um, the optimal dose is dependent on the time and the power density. So typically, if we're doing photobiomodulation, in an ideal world, if the patient can get to our office, we do eight sessions that are at least 48 hours apart. So twice a week, 48 hours apart. We don't want to do closer than that because, I mentioned, as I mentioned, the dose response curve um, needs to be, you know, 48 hours. There needs to be some time for for healing and 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 some of the changes to occur. So same spot, eight sessions, 48 hours apart, and we should begin to see some response within a session or two. We use Oralays. Often in our practice, it's been an amazing tool for us. Um, some of the reasons that we might choose to use Oralase is somebody who is in acute pain and needs to reset their system. Refractory pain patients, so if we're not getting as much progress as we'd like or as fast as we would like um, in some of our other treatments, Oralase can be a great tool to help us along. Most pain or sleep patients are in sympathetic dystrophy so um, this, because of the vagus nerve pathways and, and um, all of the other things that it can do, can help reset the system and get their feeling better and sleeping better, autonomic nervous system regulation. Often we're using Oralase for oral restrictions, so which many of our patients have, whether or not they have a full well, tongue tie, they probably have tight fascia on the tongue and floor of the mouth. So um, we'll do some sessions of this in um, hopes of uh, maybe avoiding surgery or getting getting things working because it's not just about the freedom it's about the, you know the surrounding muscle and fascia so in many many cases we can avoid having to do a surgical release um, especially if we're 
you know, of course, it's important to have um, myofunctional therapy on board. And, and we work with many um, myofunctional therapists that are um, really liking the effects that they're seeing with the, with the um, RLAs too. So that's been fun. Um, it can be used, of course, for assisting with ELF and other orthodontic therapies. Um, we will use sometimes or RLAs if a patient is locked, especially if they're in, you know, an acute pain state and have sympathetic dystrophy. Um, so many more uses, but those are how we most commonly use it. And um, like I mentioned, it's been a great tool, um, great adjunct to, to the other treatments that we're doing. So incorporating laser into our practice has been amazing and it really helps to supplement what we do. And we're learning more and more all the time about ways that we might be able to utilize it. It can be overwhelming at times. Um, you know, there's not enough standardization and protocols and settings and, and um, you know, applications and contraindications. Uh, some of the things that have been helpful for us have been um, being involved in Facebook user groups. There's photobiomodulation groups, a few of those, red light therapy groups, um, light walker groups, organizations such as the Academy, American Academy of Craniofacial Pain and other symposiums have often have lectures and potentially some courses on laser therapy. There's local study groups. We've hosted one of those and we're part of a, a, a laser um, laser group. And that's been really fun and learn a lot of um, tips and techniques from, from other people who are using this in their practice, both um, you know restorative and pain um, and sleep. Um, there's some laser certification courses. I had um, my my team go through some certification and safety training, um, and there's some more in-depth courses that are available as well. Um, there's some specialty courses such as ALF therapy and you know um, night lays. You know many of the um, companies that have laser will will do some training. There's um, new research coming out all of the time. There's websites such as photobiology.info, thorlaser.com, and many others where you can see what the latest research is and and learn more about um, protocols and results and uses. And I encourage you to check those out. And if anybody wants to contact me, um, my email is listed here, and I'm happy to talk about ways that we use it in more depth than some of the settings we use and hand pieces we use. So feel free to contact me. Thank you very much, Dr. Waterman. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again so we can share some of the resources. I've been watching some of the comments in the chat room, just basically asking questions about, you know, where to get more information, where to go to get training those kinds of things. Um, these resources down here might be a good place for you to start. There's obviously so much to know and so many different places that you can look for those resources, but the con, I mean, I obviously can only talk to the things that I know and I know oral lace and baby lace better than the other techniques and lasers that are available. Um, the, the courses on those are available at these websites, but the references and resources for this presentation today, if you guys want to look up the efficacy for snoring, or if you want to see more about the different courses and things that are available, the, the, the references for the laser assisted uvulopalloplasty are available on, I put up at the very top of this references and resources page. So all the companies that have done the research on that, including Fotona, Solea, and Light Scalpel that's coming on board with it, you'll be able to research that on your own. Um, Dr. Letterman, do you have anything you wanna to add to that? No, I don't think so. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and go through the chat box and you and I can feel them and see how we can help people understand a little bit better. Okay. Um, first question is how much experience or how much expense would be to get one of the lasers? That's very open-ended question. They can be very expensive. Um, some of the handheld ones I understand are not that expensive. I think the most important thing is to understand what use you want in your practice and to do the research on what tool would be able to get you to that end goal. And then you can talk about that. But you know, there's no one good answer for that question. Uh, Dr. Letterman, do you have anything to add to that? 
no, I, I agree. It depends on the, the kind of laser. And then there's, there's always accessories and things, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's, you know, any company would be glad to, there is some information online, you know, there's some comparison like coldlasers.org and things where it can give you a little bit of an overview of what an expense might be. And again, those, those um, user groups, they can um, be helpful too. you know, talking to other people who currently own lasers and pros and cons and things. Absolutely. And next comment is I have absolutely zero experience with lasers. Can you offer a good option for hands-on training? A lot of the time, the laser company themselves will have a hands-on training that is appropriate for that laser, which is probably the most important thing. So as we discussed with the last question, once you determine what you want the laser for in your practice, whether it's pain or sleep or you know surgical, make that selection and then reach out to them for hands-on training options. So you're going to be getting training on what they use. There's also laser study clubs that you can go to for a good overview and ask them what lasers that they offer their training on in their, their laser courses. If they offer options for multiple lasers to get trained on in courses, that would be a good place to start. Right. Yeah. And even like dental, um, you know, like in our area, we have a dental, a dental website or Facebook group or um, like a, the pain group, the Academy of Craniofacial Pain and um, asking, asking members there what, what their experience is and where they got their training. Perfect answer. Next question is how long do these laser treatments last? What modalities are needed to support the resets following treatment? I can tell you that it, that's really patient dependent. And I like to think of it as the threshold model, like say a patient is 80% well, and they only needed a little bit to get them over that hump, that last little bit of fascial restriction that wasn't able to be gotten to any other way. They might need one treatment and that, that helped them with that problem. But there's other people that are hanging around then at that 10% mark. They have so many things wrong that they need so much treatment that typically the window that we use for Oralase is typically in between 24 and 72 hours, where I explain to people that if during that period of time where the system is optimized, if we can introduce a tool or a therapy that helps them work through their restriction, whether it's oral myofunctional therapy, chiropractic physical therapy, dental appliance therapy, if we can use that therapeutic window to help them take a step up in that healing to maybe they reach to 25%, then we know that we're going in the right direction. But the laser therapies are, they, they are a therapeutic mindset. The ones that we're talking about tonight, other than the laser assisted uvuloplasty, those that is more therapeutic because you're actually modulating the collagen, but oralase and baby lays and photobiomodulation are more upregulation of the system. Anything you'd like to add to that, Dr. Letterman? I agree. So you had mentioned, I would just add that you mentioned that if they have just a little bit left to go, we also might use it early on in the treatment just to kind of get, get them going and get everything, you know, kind of fast track their, their progress along with the other, other modalities and the other, um, care care providers that they're that they're working with yeah absolutely and i didn't mean that and you don't do it at the end of treatment i mm -hmm. i literally some patients that come into my office is the only treatment that i need for them mm -hmm. yeah after oralase the, some people especially trauma patients ptsd mm -hmm. they literally start sleeping better they start dreaming they quit snoring and this is not modulating the collagen this is just optimizing the oral neuromusculature but if they have the instruction on how to actually use that oral neuromusculature through, you know, oral myofunctional therapy, then they sail through treatment because they yes. just, they were a little bit locked up. They needed this fascial release to do it. They needed a little bit of extra, you know, gas in the tank to be able to get that system to regulate. And they mm -hmm. do so great. Right. So yeah. It's very patient dependent. Yep. And we've had that experience too. And then, but I, as I mentioned, like if we're doing orally for oral restrictions, they have, you know, the myofunctional therapist, the, um, you know, primitive reflex integration, um, but they need to keep doing their exercises and proper oral posture and all of that, just because, you know, like and I use the analogy, like if you don't keep stretching your hamstrings, those are going to tighten up too. So, um, you know, doing, they, they can't stop doing the good things like, you know, proper tongue posture and nutrition and all of that, all of that. So. Absolutely. 
And the next question is, would it be accurate to say that the laser gets to deeper fascial layers than manual myofascial therapy would? I don't know how we could compare that. I do know that my massage therapist, big fan, she, you know, cause I took the, I took my portable laser with me cause there's two different delivery systems for the 1064, one that's portable and one that is less than portable. And I brought it with me and she says that her job of manual myofascial therapy was cut down maybe 75% in what she needed to do if the areas were pre-treated with the 1064 first. So I hope that answers your question. Anything from you, Dr. Letterman, on that one? Um, no, I, I agree. <laughs> but the other nice thing is you can, you can switch it from fascial mode to trigger point mode. So after you release the fascia, then you can actually go direct pressure, find the trigger point and just a couple of pulses, those trigger points melt underneath your fingers. It's pretty fantastic. So those are the ones that I'm never going to say, I'm never going to promise a one and done, but if they just had something that no one else could get to, for example, my massage therapist, she had frozen shoulder for six months and it was affecting her work. I did three sessions of Orlais and Hensler and got her back to full function three days apart. Next question is how successful is snoring treatment with laser? That's something, Dr. Letterman, can you speak to that better than I can? I don't have specific data, but um, we ha um, my associate does it and it, you know ha has seen some good results, but I don't, I don't you know, there's just some more studies that need to be done, but it, it, it can absolutely work. <laughs> and I'm going to concur. I've seen amazing results and people loving it and happily ever after. And I've seen other people that had less than optimal results, but I think we really need to be considering the patient phenotype and everything that goes into it and not just how many sessions and how many weeks apart, because we do know that sleep is multifactorial and a lot of people's sleep quality is not just about snoring. It's about fragmentation disruption and all the other things. So I think we need to learn a lot more about that. Mm -hmm. Next comment, does laser work on root cause of pain or just like painkillers, it needs to be used periodically? Well, I hope I already covered that a little bit. It can, if it is the, this fascial restriction was the root cause of the pain and we're able to reduce the restriction liquefy that hyaluronic acid, optimize the neurology and support the system in a positive direction. Um, I love the fact that it allows me to dig down to root cause because if I can eliminate as many restrictions as possible from a reversible, very conservative perspective, then I can say, okay, now this tissue totally not moving. We've reached maximum medical benefit. We've improved range of motion here, 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 and here, but we're not getting range of motion or symptom reduction here. And then it allows me to get to that root cause. And it might not be something that can be got to with the laser, but I might not been able to find the root cause without eliminating the compensations that happened over time mm -hmm. by using my laser. Mm -hmm. Um, do you use laser and static and dynamic action of muscle and joints? Yes, both. Um, <laughs> I love it with dynamic action because all the compensations kind of like, I use the analogy of getting off an elliptical machine, how your legs just want to continue that motor ingram and lift for a while by doing this control out delete with the laser, with the 1064 you can get them out of that pattern. And then if you allow them the skill and the opportunity to do dynamic action, it's even more impactful. I really get a lot of good results that way, especially achieving a posterior palatal seal. That's part of the Orlais um, therapy approach is that we can get people that could not possibly, and this happened to me, I took the oral myofunctional therapy course. And the third day of the course I had an osteopath use Orlase on me. And I literally could not get my posterior third of my tongue up to my palate, no matter how hard I tried for years. And five minutes later I could, but I use that in dynamic action. 
So I was actually trying to achieve the posterior palatal seal while the oral lays was being used on me to release that sublingual fascia and poop. And by the end of the weekend, we treated about 10 or 12 oral myofunctional therapists, speech and language pathologists, hygienists that also couldn't do their posterior palatal seal without it and could at the end of it. And that is what we find at almost every oral ACE training is that people have had surgical releases who have been trying for years, they instantly get it. And it's pretty awesome. Anything to add to that? No, I agree. Okay. <laughs> that was great. That was great. <laughs> is it best to have patients treated with laser hydrate after treatment for a period of time due to desiccating effect of the laser energy on the tissue? Um, the erbium will dehydrate the, the tissue itself um, with night lays and smooth lays and the different procedures with the erbium. Um, I don't like tissue dehydration on the surface. I like to keep everything moist. Um, for the actual hydration afterwards, just like a massage, you're mobilizing things. You want hydration in that system to make sure that now that the tissues can move, that the circulatory system has the full capacity to let it move. So just as my massage therapist gives me a bottle of water as I leave the session, we recommend the same thing for patients following oral A's and baby lays. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hydration is always great. <laughs> yes. Um, next question for trigger points. Is it better to use the 1064 instead of the MLS? I can't speak to that because I only have the 1064. So uh, Dr. Letterman, can you speak to that? Um, I don't have much experience with the MLS either. So. Okay. Okay. Informed consent forms, I think that's laser specific and technique specific as well, mm -hmm. but we do um, share our informed consent forms for our, our patients. But like I said, very, very specific to the laser being used. And I think that is all in the chat box. We do have one in the question and answer box. What age can you treat a tongue tie? And do you think it's necessary in adults or teens? Um, I've treated tongue restrictions in babies as little as a week old. And it's, it's pretty cool to be able to do that. So with baby lays, it's, it's been a blessing and a curse in my life because it, it, it's very difficult because babies are nonverbal. They cannot tell you, hey, that feels a little warm, which is a big part of oral lays. But the patient you know, the, the responses from them are what you're going on. And it's pretty awesome. I don't want to speak to surgical versus non-surgical, because I do believe that is a decision that every provider needs to make based on their experience and their training. Um, but most of the providers we train do come from a perspective of doing surgical releases. And what they find is that it makes their releases so much more sophisticated because the fascia is out of the way and they can find the inelastic fiber so much easier without the burden of the fascia and with the benefit of all the neurology being on board. Tissue mobilizes so much better, patient response is better, healing is better because you have the photobiomodulation in effect. And I think it just, it, it streamlines and simplifies the process of surgical release, but that is very, very, very provider dependent. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. That's been my experience too, that it's been um, better, better results, better, better, um, easier technique <laughs> when, when we're incorporating our lays, if we are doing surgical release. And the surgical release is up to that provider as well. So there's a lot of our trained providers that are using oral lays and baby lays and then using Solea or light scalpel, or they're using you know, the Fatona product to do the surgical release and the non-surgical. So it really is what tool works best in that provider's hands for the procedure and the patient that is in their practice at that time. So that's why a lot of the questions with how much does it cost informed consents, it's really, really specific. So this webinar was about more concepts and our experience with how to use it as craniofacial pain and sleep disordered breathing providers. More specifics, I encourage you to go down the road that we did, both Kim and I did, and just 
dig in, roll up your sleeves, start learning, listening to people, find out what works, find out what doesn't, and enjoy the ride. So we are rolling up to the end of our webinar. I want to thank everyone for being here, especially Dr. Lutterman for her contributions this evening. And I'm going to go ahead and close out for the evening. This recording will be available for everyone to watch again um, because you've registered tonight. So I want to thank everyone. Have a wonderful evening. And we're going to close the meeting now. Thank you very much.